Oh, my document was wrong. <laughs> yeah, key is in our title because we've actually started, um, we started referring to our cost savings in the units of Kias. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think someone else did the same thing as me just now, and the document said Kia on it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's actually probably the funniest mistake that I've made, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but if Kia wants to send me whatever, I mean, you know, we're okay. good. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, Jim. Um, would you mind introducing yourself and sure. then what you do at Aptiv? <laughs> Absolutely. So my name is Jim Altieri. Um, I'm an infrastructure engineer at Aptiv. And Aptiv is a digital content company. Um, we make fitness content um, that's made by our own amazing um, personal trainers. And so our members can like access workouts of lots of different types, um, anywhere they are on demand, um, and um, and also has like really good music in the background to help get you pumped for your workout. I actually think I've seen that. So I cool. think I've seen actually at some of the. So I live in I live around here, um, and I think I've seen some of the instructors from the gyms doing active content, saying that like oh. they were like. Part of their like their side thing was like making oh, cool. fitness content, Very cool. which is cool because it. What I think I really liked about things like that is that you can, even if you don't have access to like the actual, like the gym and the fitness classes, you can still get the same benefits that you can do from like being able to go to like the fancy. That's boutique exactly ones. right. Yeah, you can bring it yeah. anywhere you anywhere you bring your phone. Awesome. Um, so, can you tell me a little bit about what y'all are doing with with Fargate? Sure, so basically over the um, last several months we've migrated from Heroku onto um, exclusively onto Fargate. Um, we didn't have the um, intermediate step of EC2, ECS. It probably would have made our lives a little bit easier, but um, we went straight from um, Heroku. Um, we have a kind of monolithic API that we're also at the same time, we're peeling out into services. Um, so. You talked about um, getting your, kind of making your life easier. Can you tell me a little mm -hmm. bit about what the migration process is? Yeah, so the, the big thing where it makes it easier is that um, we didn't have, our developers didn't have any ability to check out their pull requests or anything. So part of the migration of Fargate included building out a whole new CI system. Um, that actually is really nice. And so that way, like our developers, basically, if they want to check out their code, they open up a PR. And it just deploys a version of that to a named place um, that they can access, you know, via Route 53. Um, they can just type in uh, due to a, like with a naming convention, basically, and they can get to their PR and test it out. They can test how it integrates with other services and stuff like that. Awesome. So it's all kind of it's all kind of seamless. So I can work locally as a developer. I push it up, and then I can just access. What I've pushed. Indeed, and like it's that's like the the crucial part is that we didn't want our developers to have to do anything than write their application code. You know, we didn't want them, which is like one of the things that's been awesome about Fargate is that, you know, I don't know if you've experienced this. I know you have background in ops, but sometimes developers will be like, oh yeah, it runs. I just had to go into the server and like set an <laughs> environment variable or the something horror. like that. And you're like, no. <laughs> but like there's nothing for them to SSH into. There's nothing for them to mess around with this way. I actually, I, so I hadn't thought about it that way, and I think you're right, right? Because part of what I really liked about switching to containers originally is that it solves one of the other problems, which is it it works on my machine, exactly, or it works on this really special box that I've had running for the last 429 days. Exactly. And like, as long as it, the moon is full and <laughs> I do two quick circles before uh, I get yes. on there every day, everything uh, is great. Uh, what yeah. box are you talking about? Yeah, deployment, yeah. Uh, deployment magic. Yeah. yeah, but with the containers, I could take that same box and I could do it on my local machine, I could do it on a staging environment, right. I could do the production environment, but you have taken it one step further and there's actually, there's no way in to yeah. customize them. There's so nothing you to solve do. the same problem too. <laughs> yeah, and it's all done through um, cloud formation too. So the way, that way, you know, I think it's actually like really difficult to use Fargate without cloud formation because there's lots of kind of parts yeah. that you need to provision Agreed. and they all need to talk to each other. So the nice thing is too, like we just built it in so that, um, we use Jenkins, um, so developers have, you know, in their branch, they can configure the, um, they can supply variables to their pipeline, and then that is the only way that they can mess stuff, uh, you know, mess with stuff, and the, then it's already in version control, and it's 
under control. I love the, the concept of being able to have everything kind of automated and templated, yeah. it's version controlled, <laughs> yes. there's no kind of way in there exactly. to customize other than through the yeah. actual workflow. Right, exactly. Um, do you mind telling us how you are doing monitoring and like observability with, with Fargate? Sure, yeah. I mean, it's something we're actually actively working on improving. Um, so we use a Datadog sidecar, um, and so we collect all of our stats um, to Datadog and we view them there. And that's pretty nice. We get views on the CPU usage and the memory usage. And, um, and we're working on logging, right? The standard way is to log to CloudWatch logs and then usually to ship out via Kinesis to something else. Um, we're looking to like get a little bit better logging story going on, so we have a little bit better visibility into it. Um, and then um, we also built in ability for our um, developers to forward stuff through. We have our own. Um, we have like an influx DB, so people are able to send stuff, send stats um, to that as well. <coughs> it's cool because it feels like. Despite having like less granular control by individual developers, they still have all of the same kind of tools and observability and like monitoring, debugging Ho capabilities as they did before. Hopefully, yeah, that's the, that's <laughs> the goal, right? Well, see, because I, I think what's what's cool is that that's it, that feels like to me always everyone's reservation about it is they're like, well, if I can't SSH in, how will I be able to see things? And I think you um, you all are showing that. Even if you can't SSH, you're still, you it can take, still live your life. Absolutely, it does take a little bit of a mental adjustment to yeah. get used to it, for sure. Because like, if you're used to just being able to like, oh, when in doubt, just go onto the server, right. tail a log, you know, like, um, then like you don't have that anymore. But it's just kind of more about a mental adjustment, I think. It's the same mental adjustment though that we've done, like moving to containers, That's exactly moving right. to serverless, moving to DevOps. Every single trend that we've had, there's always been like a little bit of mental adjustment, and I I like this one. Yeah, yeah. Because I think it like it removes like a, such a huge source of friction. That's like, totally right. Yep. And because it's always it is literally always people that that mess <laughs> it up for me. I mean, I'm a DevOps engineer, so all of you developers are always <laughs> messing up my stuff. <laughs> I know because the thing is, right? We're often pushed into the point of like the curmudgeonly sysadmin, which yeah. like, I don't want to be that person. Like I'm pretty curmudgeonly, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> but like, but I don't. I want to be it on my own. I don't want to be pushed into yeah. it by yeah. by. People. I think I think ops a lot of the times feels like the the no department. Exactly. Like the, you of of course you can't do that. Like right. of course you can't exec in there. Like of course you can't SSH in there. And like I think. On the record, DevOps does not love being the no department. No. We want to give you all all the tools to get exactly the information that you need. Absolutely. I had this conversation, I think, a lot with people, and this is the best solution that I've heard so far, where they're like, well, what happens when I can't exec into anything? And it's just send better information somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked Harry's, which sure. is, you've moved to Fargate, you're running on Fargate, what happens next? Yeah, I, a funny coincidence is actually one of the big things for them is also for us. We want to be able to schedule all these tasks to yeah. run at a time when we want that to run on Fargate. Um, we have a bunch of stuff in the pipeline, um, but that's something that's like right on my near-term radar. Um, another thing that's on my near-term radar is that we're we're hiring. So if any of this stuff sounds interesting to you, please reach out to us. Um, um, we we need cool developers. Um, yeah, and you know, I it's like there's so much stuff on our roadmap that it's, it's like. But I would say the biggest one for me right now is that I'm I've been thinking about is the scheduled tasks. I think run task is so underrated. Mm -hmm. Like just being able to so you don't always have to run these tasks as part of services. You can call run task or start task just from the API, and you right. can run these tasks in the same infrastructure that your services are running on, but you can schedule them, you can run them in response to events, you can call them in response to custom code. There are so many options out there other than just services. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so that's coming next. Um, you're, you've already done the, this monitoring and observability. Everything's automatic. 
so do you go on vacation? Because like that, that sounds like everything's, everything's beautiful and automatic and <laughs> templated. Like I feel like you should go on vacation. That's awesome. Yeah, my, my boss is right there. <laughs> so the, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I am going on a vacation yeah, at the end of the summer. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I mean, one of the cool things is that we, you know, we're able to have a pretty small um, infrastructure yeah. team that supports a much larger developer team. Like yeah. our developer team is on the order of 30 people right now, and we just have two two full-time infra engineers and then one like one person that splits their time um, so so you know it's um, it's nice to be able to keep the team small and tight and still be able to support quite a bit of developer operations I think that's one of the the most powerful things to me about managed services is that it lets really small lean agile right. operations teams support these huge, huge infrastructures and these huge development teams and you're able to do that with, yeah. with extra like I've run, I've run things where we managed our clusters and our scheduler and our clustering yeah. software and everything <laughs> and that like, that ends up sucking up a lot of time. Yeah, it does, exactly. Um, awesome, well Jen, this has been great. Cool. It's been a pleasure having you at uh, Twitch. Uh, after a short break, we will be right back with more content from the AWS Summit in New York.